Thank you. Warmest of welcomes to our time of worship. When the Lord Jesus was on the cross, he said, it is finished. Well, let's stand and sing our first hymn, number 600. It is finished, the Messiah dies, cut off for sins, but not his own. Hymn number 600, we'll stand to sing. Let's pray and commit our time to the Lord in prayer. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you from our hearts that many years ago, outside of Jerusalem, on the hill that is called Golgotha, the place of a skull, there in a middle cross of three, the Lord Jesus Christ hung with nails being driven into his hands and feet. And there, as the sky turned black, we praise you that he bore all our sins in his own body on the tree. And we thank you, O Lord, for the things that he said when he died. We thank you that he said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. We thank you for one of those glorious statements that he made before he died, as he was hanging there upon the cross, it is finished. We thank you that the work that you had given him to do was accomplished. We thank you, O Lord, that justice divine was satisfied. You are a holy God. You cannot look upon sin. 
you have purer eyes than to behold iniquity. And Lord, we know that you must punish sin because you are just. And we thank you that although we are very much tainted and marred by sin, by those things that offend you, we thank you that the Lord Jesus Christ took them upon himself at the cross of Calvary, all the sin of all believers, and died there in our place, bearing shame and scoffing rude. In my place, condemned he stood, sealed my pardon with his blood. Alleluia. What a saviour. Thank you for the Lord Jesus. Thank you that he was willing to go through all of those horrific injuries and sufferings, to go to the cross of Calvary, and to not bear his own sins, for he had none. Thank you that you made him who knew no sin to be sin for us. And we thank you for those who trust in Jesus, for those who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, that they become the righteousness of you, our God, in him, that all of their sins have been transferred to Christ's account and that Christ's righteousness that he won by his life, death and resurrection is accounted to the believer in Jesus. Thank you for this justification, this being declared righteous before you. We thank you that you are the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. We bless you. We thank you for this wonderful, positive, hopeful, glorious message that we never cease to hear, that we never cease to tire from hearing. We thank you, O Lord, that we are accepted in the Beloved. We thank you that it's not through anything we've done. It's not through our achievements. We thank you, O Lord, that it's not through any good works. It's not because of who we are. It's not down to the fact that we're related to somebody who's religious. We thank you, Lord, that it's not because of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man. But we thank you that it's of you. We thank you that this gospel is available to everyone. It doesn't matter where we're from. It doesn't matter what we've done in life. We thank you that grace can go deeper than any one of our sins. And we thank you, O oh God, that it is in Jesus Christ as a gift. We thank you that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of you, our God, is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And we thank you, O oh Lord, that there is still hope, that there is still opportunity. We thank you that there is still a day of grace. The day, O oh Lord, when people can call on the name of the Lord because you have said, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. What promises that you've given, O oh Lord, to a guilty and to a lost world. We say thank you. Thank you, O oh Lord, for this wonderful gospel. Thank you that it centers on Jesus and we pray that he would be uplifted this evening. We pray that he would increase and that we would decrease, O oh Lord, we're not worthy to stoop down and unloose his sandal strap. That job that was reserved for the lowest of the servants. He is worthy. He is worthy. He is altogether worthy and we are not. But we thank you for the greatness of Jesus. Thank you for the love of Jesus. Thank you, O oh Lord, that you so loved the world that you gave your only begotten Son whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Lord, we hear so much of bad news. We hear of wars, O oh Lord. We hear of all kinds of things. But Lord, we thank you that there is good news, great news, the best news, and it's found in Jesus. We thank you, O oh Lord, that you ever sent your Son. And we thank you that he has power to save. Lord, he has power to save the hardest. He has power to save the person who's rejected the gospel so many times. Lord, we thank you that you can break down the hardest of hearts. And we pray that you would do. Be with us this evening as we open our Bibles, as we read from the pages of your word. We thank you that we are not reading out of a mere book. But Lord, we are reading the very words of you, the living God. Help us as we sing these hymns that convey biblical truths. We thank you, O oh Lord, for an opportunity to hear your word being explained and applied. And we ask, O oh Lord, that we would be attentive. We pray that you would speak to our hearts. 
Let us know that it's from you. Let us know, O oh God, that you are speaking to us. Please be near. Please watch over us. May this time be truly uplifting in our hearts because we pray these things through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let's open our Bibles and we turn to three readings this evening. Three readings this evening. And it will become apparent why we're reading these three short readings. The first one is from Matthew chapter 8 verses 1 to 4. And then we're going to read from Mark. And then we're going to read from Luke. All right, I'll give you the references as we go so that it will be simple for us. The first reading then is Matthew chapter 8. Matthew chapter 8 verses 1 to 4. It can be found on page 855 there in our church Bible. Matthew chapter 8 verses 1 to to four. When he, that is Jesus, had come down from the mountain, great multitudes followed him. And behold, a leper came and worshipped him, saying, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Then Jesus put out his hand and touched him, saying, I am willing, be cleansed. Immediately his leprosy was cleansed. And Jesus said to him, See that you tell no one, but go your way, show yourself to the priest, and offer the gift that Moses commanded as a testimony to them. And now we're going to turn to Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1, the next book along, verses 40 to 45. That's on page 883. Mark chapter 1, verses 40 to 45. Now a leper came to him, imploring him, kneeling down to him, and saying to him, If you are willing, you can make me clean. Then Jesus moved with compassion, stretched out his hand, and touched him, and said to him, I am willing, be cleansed. As soon as he had spoken, immediately the leprosy left him, and he was cleansed. And he strictly warned him, and sent him away at once, and said to him, See that you say nothing to anyone, but go your way, show yourself to the priest, and offer for your cleansing those things which Moses commanded as a testimony to them. However, he went out and began to proclaim it freely and to spread the matter so that Jesus could no longer openly enter the city, but was outside in deserted places, and they came to him from every direction. And now we turn to Luke chapter 8, sorry, Luke chapter 5, Luke chapter 5, verses 12 to 16. Luke chapter 5, verses 12 to 16. Page 909 in our church Bible. Luke chapter 5, beginning to read at verse 12, page 909. And it happens when he was in a certain city that behold a man who was full of leprosy saw Jesus and he fell on his face and implored him saying, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Then he put out his hand and touched him, saying, I am willing, be cleansed. Immediately the leprosy left him. And he charged him to tell no one, but go and show yourself to the priest and make an offering for your cleansing as a testimony to them, just as Moses commanded. However, the report went around concerning him all the more. And great multitudes came together to hear and to be healed by him of their infirmities. So he himself often withdrew into the wilderness and prayed. Let's stand and sing our second hymn, number 191 in our hymn books. Number 191 with harps and with vials, there stands a great throng. 191. Oh, 
Let us pray again. Heavenly Father, we do praise and thank you for the love of the Lord Jesus. We praise you, O Lord, unto him who loved us. And for every believer, we can say that he has washed us from sin. And unto him be the glory forever and ever. We praise the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We worship him. We praise you for the way that he saves sinners. We thank you that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Oh, Father, we praise you. We thank you for this great message, this great gospel. And we pray this evening that wherever it is proclaimed in sincerity and in truth, wherever, O oh Lord, it is uttered, we ask that you would supply blessing and mercy and peace we pray that you would grant success to the gospel. We earnestly, humbly pray that you would cause people to turn from sin to Christ. We pray that there would be conversions. We pray that people would trust in Jesus, that sinners will be converted to you. We pray, Lord, that you would arrest people in their state without Christ, their hopelessness without him, and we pray that people will come to Christ, believe in Christ. Oh, Father, we thank you for our dear brothers and sisters in the Lord Jesus. We pray for those who cannot be here this evening. Be with Morris, we pray, and Shirley. We don't know the latest news, but be with them wherever they are. Watch over them, oh, Father. We pray that whatever has had to happen in a hospital, that all would be well, that you would have given wisdom and skill to those who were seeing to him. Pray, O oh Lord, that you would be with Shirley and Julie and Harry and the family. Watch over them, we pray. And O oh Lord, we ask that you would give them the peace and joy of the Lord Jesus. And we also pray, our Father, for ourselves who are here. 
We pray that you would be with us, give us grace and peace and joy. We ask that you would speak to us from your word. We thank you that your word is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Oh, we thank you that this book is our guide to heaven. We thank you that this is the bread of life that we feed on. We thank you that this is truly our guide and our guard. We thank you that it's our map and we thank you that it's our compass. We thank you that it's our sword and we thank you that it's our shield. And we pray, O oh God, that you would speak to us from its pages this evening. We thank you that your word is a living word. The flower fades, O oh Lord. But we thank you that the word of our Lord endures forever. We thank you for the relevancy. We thank you, O oh God, for the potency, the power of you in your word by your spirit. Cause there, Lord, to be this evening a message that we would really be able to grasp and that you would speak to us. You know where we're up to. We thank you that we can't pull the will over your eyes. You know exactly where we're up to in life. And we pray, therefore, that you would speak to us, every one of us. Let us know that it's your voice speaking to us from your word, by your spirit, even this evening. Do us good, because we pray it in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Before the message, let's sing again hymn number 548. Hymn number 548. I need thee, precious Jesus, for I am full of sin. My soul is dark and guilty. My heart is dead within. I need the cleansing fountain where I can always flee. The blood of Christ most precious, the sinner's perfect plea. Number 548.
I don't know if you like taking pictures, if you're a photographer, that one of your pastimes or hobbies is photography, but one of the basic requirements of a good photo is that it's in focus. And do you remember those old cameras, those old SLR cameras, those big fat things, and you'd have to put the film in, and everything was done manually. The aperture and the shutter speed and the focus, all had to do it manually. Of course, today it's all automatic, and you can take pictures on your phone, and you can do all sorts of things. But nonetheless, you still need to make sure that the photograph is in sharp focus. It's not blurry and it's not hazy, the person or the scene that you want to take that photograph of. And in the same way, the Gospels of the Lord Jesus put in sharp focus for us the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not that the 62 other books of the Bible do not highlight and emphasize the Lord Jesus Christ. They do. The whole of the Bible is the word of Christ. It is about the Lord Jesus Christ. But the Gospels especially home in on Jesus Christ. On all these events and all these incidents, on all these people that Jesus met. They home in on what he's like, on what he came to do in saving people from their sins. And we're going to look at one of these incidents from the Gospels this evening. That highlight the Lord Jesus Christ that really highlight who he is and highlight what he came to do. In looking at the Gospels, always focus on Jesus Christ. I remember speaking to a minister once and been in the ministry for 40 years and he'd gone through every single one of the Gospels, or four of them in his time, and he said that actually one of the criticisms of himself, and I think he was doing himself a bit of a disservice, I'm sure that he would have lifted up the Lord Jesus, but he said that one of the criticisms that he had was he would focus on all the incidentals and not focus on the Lord Jesus Christ himself, and it can be easy to do that, and to focus upon the issues about who he met and where he was and everything else and not to focus upon him well when we read we must focus on Christ and when we read the gospels especially focus on Jesus Christ put Jesus Christ at the front and center so we're going to be looking at Christ healing a leper Christ healing a leper it's in all three of the synoptic Gospels, which is Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And there are five things that we're going to look at as we think about this incident of Jesus healing this leprous man. The first thing we're going to see is this. This man's predicament outside of Christ. This man's predicament outside of Christ. And then in the second place, we'll notice this man's movement towards Christ. And then thirdly, we'll see this man's statement to Christ. Then fourthly, this man's encouragement from Christ. And then fifthly, this man's fulfillment by Christ. Or if you like, if you want to keep it simple and just have key words, then the first will be predicament, the second movement, the third statement, the fourth encouragement, and the fifth fulfillment. So first of all then, we notice this man's predicament outside of Christ. The Lord Jesus has come from heaven to this earth. He has begun his public ministry. It is relatively early in the Lord Jesus' public ministry at this particular stage. And he's in a certain city. We don't exactly know which city that he's in, but he's in a city. And where Jesus was at any given time was not random. It was not just, well, whatever took his fancy, there's where he would be. And our lives are not random. We're told that it happened or it came to pass when he, that's Jesus, was in a certain city. The events of the Lord Jesus, where Jesus was, the time where he was, the place where he was, the people that he met, they're not incidental. They're actually important. They're actually not a random mess. It's all planned. 
And our lives are planned. Sometimes you might wonder, well, what's going on in our lives? Why do we go through what we go through? And life seems to be chaotic. It doesn't seem to have too much of an order or a pattern to it. Well, don't forget that God is in control. There's no accidents with God. He ordains whatever happens with a way that removes him from being the author of sin. God is completely, 100% sovereign. He really is. And he's sovereign over the life of the Lord Jesus, even though the Lord Jesus is equal with his heavenly Father. It's just like a train track. Imagine seeing a load of train tracks at a junction and loads of points and it just looks a random mess until we notice the signalman up at the top with his box and there he is and he knows exactly what's going down underneath. And so it is with life as we think of it as being messy and seemingly random yet it has a purpose. God up there is in control of all of these events and God is in control of the Lord Jesus as he's going into this particular city and as he meets this particular man. So Jesus meets this man. It says, behold. Behold. That means look. It means consider. Maybe you've been going and you're seeing a sight and you're with somebody and you say, look at that. And you want their attention to be drawn to that particular sight or to that particular person who's doing something maybe unusual, whatever it is. And we say, look at that. And that's the word behold here. It means to consider. It means look at that. Behold. Gaze on this. Behold this man. Because this man was no ordinary man. He was not a conventional man. This man had a problem. He had a deep problem. And his problem was leprosy. It was prevalent in the Middle East in those days. It's still in the world today. It's still people who are leprous, and we do need to pray for people who are involved in leprosy missions. They're doing a great work, aren't they? Tremendous work, and leprosy is a horrid disease. And this man had it. It goes on the skin, it spreads, it gets into the blood, it corrupts the blood, it gets into the bones, and this man didn't just have leprosy, he was full of leprosy. Luke adds that detail, full of leprosy. One of the reasons why we read all three of the incidents, even though they're the same incident, is because they looked at it from a slightly different angle, and Matthew gives us things that Mark and Luke don't give us, and Mark gives us things that the other two don't give us, and Luke gives us things that the other two don't give us. So when we put them together, we get an all-rounded perspective of these particular events. And Luke was a medical doctor, and he was interested in details, and here he's interested in this particular detail of this man who was full of leprosy. The others don't mention the fact he was full of leprosy, but Luke does. He's full of leprosy. He's covered in it. Every part of him has this leprous condition about him. There's not one part of it that hasn't been corrupted and hasn't been tainted and marred by leprosy. He was in a deplorable state. He was what we say down south, he was in a two and eight. He was in a real state, in a real mess, was this leprous man. And as we look at leprosy, it has an illustration for us, a likeness that's very, very similar. It's a parallel to the far worse condition that every single one of us has. It doesn't matter who we are. It doesn't matter how old we are. It doesn't matter where we're from. It doesn't matter how educated or uneducated we actually are. Every single one of us has a problem with this disease that is far worse than leprosy. And it provides an illustration for us, an emblem for us, and a picture for us of the thing that every single one of us has. We can't get around it. It's the elephant in the room. It's what we've all got from the top of society, from the high echelons of society, right down to the bottom of society. Every single one of us in the world has this particular disease. What is it? It's called sin. Every single one of us has. And every single one of us does not just have sin, but every one of us is full of sin. We believe in a teaching called total depravity. Well, what does that mean? Well, it doesn't mean that man is possibly depraved as they possibly can be. That's not what it teaches at all. Because we're not. God's given decency to people. 
Your next door neighbour is not likely to be a terrorist. I hope not. And there's a common decency, isn't there? People are not as depraved as they possibly can be. So what does it mean? It means this, that every part of our makeup has sin within it. We're totally depraved. Every place of us, every part of us has sin. There's a glass of water. Now just imagine if you were to get a, some dye and then you were to put just a little bit of a pipette in, in, of, of dye into this water and then every part of this water would have dye within it. And in the same way, every single part of us has sin within it. It affects the way we think. It affects the way we talk. It affects the way we act. It affects the way we react. Every one of us is full of sin. Behold a man full of leprosy. Behold a man full of leprosy. Behold a person full of sin. That's what we've got to say. Now we're very easy sometimes to say, yeah, behold a person full of sin. Yeah, Putin. Behold a person full of sin. Oh, yeah, 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 the other person's, yeah, yeah, Hitler in the past. Be older person full of sin. Yeah, we like that. But actually, what we're to do is to look at a proverbial mirror and to say it of ourselves. We're very easy at, at thinking and dwelling. You know, I'm past master of you, uh, looking at the faults of everybody else. But as soon as somebody else points a fault at us, ah, different story. Ah, no, 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 I want to wriggle out of it. It's not my fault. It's not this. No, 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 no. We've got to get real, haven't we? We've got to understand that every one of us, by nature, is a sinner. We hold a person full of sin. Sin is so ingrained into us, just like leprosy was ingrained into this poor man. And we're in a poor condition by nature. In every part of us, we have sin. Behold a person full of sin. Our predicament outside of Christ. Secondly, we see this man's movement towards Christ. Well, what was this man going to do? Well, there were certain laws in the Old Testament about leprosy because it was very common. It was contagious. It's an awful disease. You lose your nerve endings, by the way. So when you touch something, you can't feel it. So if they touch something hot, like a pan or a, a hot ring, they wouldn't be able to feel it and burn themselves. It's awful. You lose all the end, end of your nerve endings. It's a horrible, horrible, horrible disease. It, it really is. And there wasn't a cure for it. I don't know if there is now, but there certainly wasn't. You couldn't send someone to the doctor. Oh yeah, he's got leprosy. Oh yeah, that's very common. I know what we'll do. We'll just give him a bit of medicine, right as rain, in a couple of months, so that it doesn't spread. No. They sent them out as an outcast, and anybody who came near, they had to say, unclean, unclean. You know, COVID wasn't the first time for isolation, you know. <laughs> they had isolation in the Bible for people that weren't well in, in, in leprosy. And they would have to go out, anyone going near, unclean, unclean. They were in an awful predicament and they couldn't be cured by natural means. It had to be a supernatural work in order for somebody to be cured of their leprosy. And in the same way, it has to be a supernatural work of God in order for our sins to be forgiven. You can't just take a bit of medicine. I'll have a bit of church. I'll have a bit of religion in my life. No, it doesn't wash. No, we've still got sins. It's got to be Jesus who cures us of our sins. And this man in this city, he's obviously on the outskirts of this city, it might even be a city without walls because they weren't to be in a, a walled city. We don't know, but the point is this man saw Jesus. Out of all of the people that he could despise, this man looked at Jesus. Ah, there's my hope. So this man saw Jesus. That was the first step for this man to be cured. He saw Jesus. And what this man did physically, we should do spiritually. We should be looking towards Jesus Christ. We can't physically see him. The Bible says, whom having not seen, you love, but we should be gazing upon Jesus. In our hopelessness, in our helplessness, we should be looking towards Jesus Christ. Looking and gazing to Christ for our answer. He sees Jesus. And then the next thing is, he came to Jesus. Mark chapter 1 verse 40 tells us that this leper came to Jesus. He actually came to him. And again, what this man did 
physically, we need to do spiritually. What this man did in his physical ailment, we must do in our spiritual condition that we all have. We need to be those who come to Christ. Out of all of the people that he could have come to, out of all of the rabbis in that city, out of all of the people that he could have gone to for help, for doctors and everything else, this man turns to the right man. This man turns to Jesus. And he comes to Jesus. And then there's another step in terms of his movement. And that is that he worships Jesus. In Matthew's Gospel, we're told in his version that he worships Jesus. He actually adores Christ. He worships him. He gives him adoration. He's like Doubting Thomas, isn't he? You remember Doubting Thomas? Nah, all the other disciples, they see Jesus and he says, nah, I don't believe it. Unless I put my finger in that nail print and put my finger in his side, I'm not going to believe. And Jesus graciously comes to Thomas and he says, look, come here and then put your finger in, in my nail print and put your hand into my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. And what was Thomas's response? My Lord and my God. He worshipped Jesus, and Jesus accepted the worship. Do you know, whenever people worship Jesus, he accepted the worship. If Jesus was just a good man, if Jesus was just a godly man, but not the God man, then there's no way he would have accepted the worship. What happened when other people worshipped Jesus? Others, they said, nope, don't worship me. Tried to worship the Apostle Paul, nope, don't worship me. Any good man doesn't want worship. Any good man doesn't want people to worship them. But Jesus accepts the worship all the time. He never rejects anybody who worships him. And this leper has got it. He comes to Jesus and he worships Jesus. Do you worship the Lord Jesus Christ? Do you praise the Lord Jesus? Do you say that person who walked the streets of Nazareth is none other than the Lord God Almighty and he's my Lord and he's my God and I worship Jesus Christ. Do you worship Jesus Christ? And then there's another step about this movement of this man and it's this, he knelt down. He didn't come in any sense of entitlement. He didn't come saying, well, you know what, I'm quite worthy and I'm quite a good man before I had leprosy and please, would you mind just looking on my good works and just looking on some of the things that I've done? He didn't do that, did he? He came kneeling before Jesus. He came bowing down before him, kneeling before him, prostrate before him. There was nothing of pride. There was nothing of self-entitlement. There was nothing of self-decency in that sense about him, was there? He came in a a based way. He came in a humble way. And that's how we should come to the Lord Jesus. We're sinners before him. He's the sinless son of God. And we're sinful people to the core. Well, how dare we come before the Lord Jesus in any sense of pride and entitlement or anything like that? No. We should be like this man. We should come before Jesus humbly. Come before Christ reverently. Because that's how this leper came to the Lord Jesus Christ. And we know there's another thing about him. Not only did he see Jesus, and not only did he come to Jesus, and not only did he kneel before the Lord Jesus and worship the Lord Jesus, but he implored the Lord Jesus. What does it say in Luke chapter 5 and in verse 12? And he fell on his face and implored him. He implored, he besought the Lord. You see, this man was in earnest. He wasn't even come to Jesus and say, well, you know what? I'm in a real predicament here. I've got leprosy and it's not looking too good for me and there's no cure and I'd really appreciate it if you could just sort of, you know, cure me. But if you can't, then don't worry about it too much. Is that how he was? How he was and he implores him. He begs him. He says, Lord, please cure me of my my leprosy. And that's how we should be as sinners. We should come before the Lord Jesus, imploring the Lord Jesus, imploring him to take away our sins, to take away this hideous thing that we all have of sin that will drag us lower than the grave for an eternity away from God. We should implore him to take it away. We should be beseeching him. We should be in earnest over our condition. We're sinners that need saving. I'm sure that if you had a physical condition that was bad and severe, that you would want to do anything to get rid of that condition. Wouldn't you? You would go through it. People do. and I'm sure you would and I would. We'd go through all sorts of things. We'll do anything in order for us to be healed. But when it comes to people's sin, I don't worry about that too much. But this is more serious. 
This is deeply serious. This would take us away from God forever. And yet how we need to come to Jesus and implore him. So what have we seen? We've seen this man's predicament outside of Christ. This man's movement toward Christ. Thirdly, let's look at this man's statement to Christ. What does he say? You see, now the things that we can surmise, the things that are implicit, are now explicit, aren't they? The things that were before implied, this man realised that he was in a state, otherwise he wouldn't have come to Jesus in the first place, would he? But now he acknowledges that he's in a state. Just by saying, Lord, if you're willing, you can make me clean. He says it there. He knows that he's not right as he is. And that's what we've got to do. We've got to realise that we're not right as we are in our natural condition. Can't just keep going on like it. In our sins. We've got to own up to our sins. We've got to admit our sins. And this man is reverent. Look at the first word that he uttered. Lord, And this Lord is more than just respect of of sir. This means boss because of what's going to come out of his mouth. Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. He says, Lord. He's he's reverent. Are you? Do you call him Lord from the heart? Do you realise that the Lord Jesus Christ is fully God? He's King of kings and he's Lord of lords. And we say, Lord. Lord. Do you call him Lord and mean it? Is he your Lord this evening? This man, he called Jesus Lord. Lord, he says, if you are willing. He appeals to Jesus' willingness. He's saying, Lord, if you would incline to me. Lord, if you so desired. Lord, if it was your delight. If you just looked upon me in a favourable way. If you just condescended to be with me. Lord, if you are willing then you can make me clean. In other words, you've got the power. The word can here is the word actually where we get the word dynamite from. You've got the dynamite. You've got the power. You've got the potency to save me, to cleanse me. You can do it. He knew Jesus' power, didn't he? He never doubted his power for a minute. Do you doubt his power? In your sin and in your state and in your predicament outside of Christ where your sins are not forgiven. Do you doubt him? Do you know we're going to sing a hymn in a minute and it says this. He is able. He is able. He is willing. Doubt no more. He is able to save you. He is able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him since he ever lives to make intercession for us. Never come to Jesus doubting his power. Never come to him doubting his ability. He is able to save. He is saved from the guttermost. He is saved from people who've got themselves caught up in all manner of sins. He saved a prostitute called Rahab. He saved a king called Manasseh who filled Jerusalem with blood from one end to another. And he saved him. Friends, he can save you this evening. If you would but ask him. If you would but tell him. If you would but cry out to him. Lord, if you are willing... You can make me clean. You can make me clean from this disease that I have that will take me from all eternity away from you. I'm in a state without you, Lord. Please save me. He's powerful to save. He is mighty to save. If you are willing, you can make me clean. You can clean me up. You've got the ability to do it. And Jesus has the ability to take away our sins. So what have we seen? Number one, we've seen this man's predicament outside of Christ. And our predicament outside of Christ. We've seen, secondly, this man's movement towards Christ. He was seeing Christ. He came and coming to Christ. He worshipped Christ. He bowed down to the Lord Jesus. He besought the Lord Jesus. He implored the Lord Jesus. This man's statement to Christ. He knows his need. He's he's not hoodwinking himself. He's not deceiving himself. He's not pulling the wool over his eyes. He's not the elephant in the room that he's not dealing with it. He owns up to the fact that he has this awful condition. It was obvious. It was staring him in the face. And so have we. We have this awful condition of sin, friends. It's staring us in the face. We can't deny it. We can't get away from it. Our conscience tells us it. The Word of God explains it. And it's true for all of us, isn't it? That we are sinners by nature and by practice. And we've got to own up to it. 
And we've got to say, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. That same person. Then fourthly, we see this man's encouragement from Christ. Well, what's Jesus going to do now? What's Jesus going to do to this leper? Well, before we look at his words, we need to look at Jesus' attitudes, don't we? Because in Mark's version, we're told that he moved with compassion. He was moved with compassion. How many times in the Gospels do we read those lovely words? He was moved with compassion. When he saw people, when he saw incidents, when he saw things take place, he was moved with compassion. The Lord Jesus moved with compassion with Jesus. Do you ever watch those adverts, maybe for humanitarian aid or something like that, and your heart goes out. Maybe you see someone in an awful state and they're maybe scantily clad or you know, they're starving or whatever, and your heart goes out to them. Well, the Lord Jesus' heart went out to this leper. His heart went out to him. And his heart went out to many others. There was a compassion in the Lord Jesus Christ. And there is a compassion for Jesus, for sinners. Do you know his compassion for sinners like you and me? It led him all the way to Calvary's cross. He led him all the way to go and to be stripped of his dignity and of his worth. And he was nailed upon the cross. That's what his compassion led him to. If you ever doubt the compassion of Jesus, just look at Calvary. He was willing to go through all of those injuries, all of those pains, all of those sorrows. Why? Because he has compassion for sinners to be saved from their sins. The compassion of Jesus. The love of the Lord Jesus. And then we're told that he stretched out his hands and touched this leper. Would you have done that? Jesus did. Now this man's obviously respectful. He keeps a bit of a distance. There's social distancing for us. And there he is. And he keeps his distance. And Jesus stretches out his hand and he touches him. He touches him. The touch of the Lord Jesus. Now we've never felt the touch of the Lord Jesus physically, but what about spiritually? Have you ever felt the touch of Christ? The sweetness of the touch of the Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ, that touch of Jesus. Have you ever heard of a man who lived many, many years ago called Francis of Assisi? Ever heard of Francis of Assisi? Do you know Francis of Assisi was reflecting upon Jesus' attitude towards this leper and it changed his life. How the events of the Gospels and looking at Jesus and how he dealt with these situations should change our lives. Should change us, isn't it? It's mind-blowing. His compassion and his touch as he touched this particular leper. It's incredible, isn't it? This wondrous touch that he had upon him. And then he speaks to him and he gives him encouragement. And he simply says, I will. And it's another one of these I will statements that we're looking at on these Sunday evenings. We've been looking at some of these I wills of the Bible. And here's another one from the Lord Jesus. I will, or I am willing, but it literally is I will. Other versions translate it as I will. I will. He is willing. The Lord Jesus is willing to save sinners. Do you know the Lord Jesus Christ is not in heaven not wanting to save sinners. He's not willing that any should perish. He has no death in the, no pleasure in the death of the wicked. He's not sitting there in heaven wanting people to go to hell at all. There's no, no pleasure in the death of the wicked at all. He says, I am willing. He's willing. How can we know his willingness? Because Jesus is prepared to be willing to go to Calvary's cross. He's willing to be stripped naked. He's willing to be robbed of his dignity. He's willing to be hang upon that cross and to bear our sins and our shame and, and, and the guilt of our sins and the corruption of our sins. He's willing. There's a lovely hymn. It's not in our hymn book actually, but it's in Grace Hymns. And it's this. It says, How willing was Jesus to die that we fellow sinners might live the life they could not take away. How ready was Jesus to give. Jesus went to the cross willingly. He prayed in that garden as he sweat great drops of blood. Not my will, but yours be done. And he went in his willingness to Calvary to wash us from this awful disease that we have in our soul called sin. He went to Calvary. He was willing. I am willing. 
And he has authority and he has ability. Because he says, be cleansed. It's a word of command. It's not, well, I don't know if I could do that. And Well, we'll just see how you get on. Now, hang on, you're on probation, leper. We'll just see how you get on for three months. If you're a good boy, then you might just be cleansed. Play your cards right and you might be all right. No, it's not a bit of it, is that? It's not a bit of it. Be cleansed. Be cleansed. And the Lord Jesus cleanses sinners. What a thing it is. What a thing it is for us to have our sins forgiven. As far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our transgressions from us. He's put our sins into the depths of the sea for those that come to him to be clean, to be pure before our maker, to know that we can say there is no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. That's us. For those who trusted in him, for those who believe in him, to have the joy of sins forgiven through the Lord Jesus. So we've seen this man's predicament outside of Christ, this man's movement toward Christ, this man's statement to Christ, this man's encouragement from Christ, and it gives the sinner every encouragement, and fifthly, this man's fulfillment by Christ. What happened? What was the upshot? What did this leper do when he heard the words of the Lord Jesus? What did he do? We're told that he was cleansed immediately. The leprosy left him. This man who was a leper, his leprosy goes. His bones are restored. His blood is pure. His skin is, is, is pure again. He's been cleansed of his leprosy. He's been purified. Do you know there is a lady and, and she was put in a concentration camp in, in the Second World War. Her name was Corrie Ten Boom. And her sister, who was put in the concentration camp as well, who was a believer, Betsy, she said this, there is no pit that is too deep that he is not deeper still. There is no pit that is too deep that he is not deeper still. He's deeper still. You may be in the very pits of sin. You may know yourself to be guilty. You may know yourself to be wretched before God as we all are. But to know that pardon... To know that forgiveness. To know that cleansing by the blood of Jesus. What a thing it is. Grace abounding to the chief of sinners. It, it's wonderful to have our sins pardoned and dealt with. And how much of his leprosy went? And we're told he was full of leprosy. And we're told the leprosy left him. So it was all his leprosy. It wasn't a part of his leprosy. It wasn't a good majority of his leprosy. It wasn't 99.9% .9 of his leprosy. And he had 0 0.1 left. It wasn't only a little scab that was like remaining. No. All of his leprosy had gone. And he was at a far state, covered with it, full of it. And when a person comes to Christ, and when a person receives of the Lord Jesus, all that sins are pardoned and forgiven. All of your sins are forgiven. Past, present, and future. Every single one of them is taken away. All of them. Jesus doesn't just pay for a percentage of our sins. He pays for all of our sins on the cross. We could never make up the difference. However small, even if it was 0.1%, we could never do it. However hard we tried, Jesus paid it all. All of the sins forgiven. All of the sins pardoned. And when was it? Was, did he have to wait a week? Did he have to wait a month? Did it, was it a slow process over a short period of time or a long period of time? And, and little by little, he was regaining strength, you know, when you have an illness. And, and little by little, you get yourself back on your feet. No. Immediately, his leprosy left him. How many events when the Lord Jesus healed someone? Was it immediate? Immediately their problem was dealt with. And immediately our sins are forgiven. Immediately. It's a transaction that occurs when we come to Christ. This legal issue takes place and we're regarded in God's thinking as forgiven, as pardoned, as a forgiven sinner before God. Immediately. His leprosy left him. Immediately our sins are forgiven when we come to Christ but you've got to come. 
You've got to come. What about if that man never came? Still leprosy. But he came. And what about you? Are you going to come? Are you going to be like this man in, in your awful thing of sin and say, Lord, forgive me of my sin. Pardon me of, 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 of all my offences to you. And receive the same welcome that this man had. The same compassion that Jesus expressed. The same forgiveness that we can have when we come to him and have this cleansing from our sins. In Jesus Christ. Come to him. Have your sins forgiven. How many times did the Lord Jesus say, your sins are forgiven you. Your sins are forgiven you. All words. To hear those words, your sins are forgiven you. And if they have been forgiven, and if you're a believer in the Lord Jesus this evening, can't you rejoice? Don't your sins mount up? They do. And they're the sins that we can remember. They mount up and up and up. Do you ever think about your past sins? Oh, I do. I think about the things that I've said and done. And they come to you, don't they? But they're forgiven in the blood. And washed clean. Rejoice, Christian. That our sins are forgiven. And that we're going to heaven. Christ healing this leper. Let's sing our final hymn, number 539, that we quoted from earlier on. 539, come ye sinners, poor and wretched, weak and wounded, sick and sore. Jesus ready stands to save you, full of pity, joined with power. He is able, he is able, he is willing, doubt no more. 539.
Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to God our Saviour, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen.